Good morning, and once again, welcome. This lesson is being recorded for Sunday, July the 24th, 2022. This is the lesson that will be presented when we assemble together here at 1050 in Bellflower, California. And as is always the case, uh, if you are in our area, we invite you to come and be with us as we gather to worship God on Sundays at 1050 as well as at 6 p.m. We also have some online Bible studies during the week, one on Sunday morning at 9 as well as on Wednesday night at 730. And if you're interested in joining us on those, if you would drop me a note, I can get you the information on how to become a part of that. Uh, th that is what we are doing right now. Uh, we are continuing to do that virtually for a handful of reasons. But nevertheless, before I actually get into uh, my lesson this morning, I just wanted to briefly say it is good to be back after uh, a, break, uh, a break for a few weeks. I've, I've dealt with some personal matters as well as engaged in, in, in a, a study with a number of gospel preachers, something that I look forward to every year where we gather together for an intense level of studying. But nevertheless, it is good to be back. And um, I look forward to sharing the Word of God with you uh, this week. And, and also next week I'm going to record these lessons. But the, uh, they're more than likely the following week, uh, I may or I may not be able to get to some lessons because of some other actions that are taking place uh, in my life. But then we ought to get back to normal after that. But nevertheless, let's go ahead and... Uh, uh, start with our lesson for today. Now, I was here last week. It's just I didn't arrive home till Saturday the week before, which is why I did not record videos. But we did continue to deal with our Closer to God series. And what we dealt with in our lesson last week is we dealt with the holiness of Jesus. And we established his holiness and what that ought to mean to us. And uh, that lesson is available at our website, www.roseavenue.org. The audio recording when I presented it live is available there, as well as the PowerPoint, uh, the outline. Those are things that I always like to make available to you. I, I like for you to have a resource, something that you can actually look at as you are studying the Word of God, and that's why that's why um, uh, we've chosen to do more than just simply provide recordings of our lessons. We want them to be something that you can use in the future, that you can look at, and that you can study and make notes with it and use it as you're trying to teach others. So having said that, let's get to the lesson at hand. As I said last week, we talked about the holiness of Jesus. Today we're going to talk about the holiness of the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, this is a continuation of our theme for 2022, which is drawing closer to God. And in this theme, we've talked about what holiness is. We've talked about sin and how sin separates us from God. We've also talked about the subject of the grace of God in great detail. And then we have started focusing on holiness. And, and actually, this is the sixth lesson dealing with the subject of holiness. Our first lesson, we talked about what holiness is. And, and then we've been talking about the holiness of God. We devoted three lessons to the holiness of God in general. And then last week, Jesus Christ. And today, as you see on our screen here, we want to talk about the third person of the triune God, the Holy Spirit. And we want to talk about His holiness. And of course, um, we ought to know that He is holy when you give consideration to that's how He's described over and over in Scripture. And that fact alone ought to uh, cause us to... Uh, consider His holiness. Now, who exactly is the Holy Spirit? And what we want to do in this lesson is we want to talk about who the Holy Spirit is for a moment. We want to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit. In our lesson last week, we talked about the work of Jesus and the way that He lived and how that demonstrated His holiness. We're going to see holiness in the work that the Spirit does. And then we're also going to make a, a little bit of application at the end where we're going to talk about uh, what this means to us. As I understand that the, the Holy Spirit is holy and, and how he works with us today and within us, how do we respond to him acknowledging his holiness? Now, this is going to lead to my next section, which is going to be several lessons where we are going to continue to talk about holiness. But after this lesson, we're going to talk about 
um, how we can be holy. What does it mean because when we understand the holiness of God, the triune God, how do I respond to that and how do I strive to be holy and to maintain a holy life? That's what we're going to be dealing with in coming weeks uh, as we continue our study of drawing closer to God. But let's go ahead and get started today dealing with the subject of the Holy Spirit. As I've already mentioned, he is the third person of the triune God. Of course, if you study God in Scripture, you find that God is described in three different persons, something I'm just going to briefly deal with in this lesson. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about in this first section, we could actually devote a number of weeks to each and every one of, uh, to, to a study of the Holy Spirit and, and devoting considerable time to each one of the aspects that we're going to be dealing with. That's not the purpose of this lesson. This is kind of a, a summary description of, of, of who He is, who Holy Spirit is, and how He works within us today because that's what we want to understand when we deal with the subject of holiness and the Holy Spirit being holy. And what you need to understand is that when we say he's the third person of the triune God, he is not merely a a force or a spiritual essence of the Father and Jesus. I've actually heard before of some who advocated that the Godhead consisted of two, the Father and Jesus, and, and the Spirit was their spirit. So it was the essence or the force behind those two persons in the Godhead. I I believe that is false for a number of reasons. He is his own person. He is the third person of the triune God. He's all throughout scripture. He's introduced in Genesis chapter 1 at creation. Verse 1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God was was hovering over the face of the deep. You have him introduced there in Genesis 1 and verse 2. And you go to Revelation chapter 22 and in in verse 17, one of the last verses, there's a couple of verses after this, but it talks about the bride and the Spirit. Say, come. The Spirit invites you. And understand that all in between these verses, the Holy Spirit is dealt with over and over and over. Now we're going to be focusing primarily on the New Testament in this lesson. And I want you to understand that word holy that we have been dealing with. It's found, the term holy is found about 278 times. There's some other derivatives that would add some numbers to that. But the term holy is found about 278 times And a little over a third, or roughly a third of those, is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And sometimes he's described as the Holy Spirit or Holy Spirit. And we find that not only is the name Holy Spirit attributed to him 97 times, we find (coughs) that he, the person, Holy Spirit, is actually referenced about 278 times in the New Testament. And those other times would be uh, examples where he might be uh, described as something else. Rather than Holy Spirit, he may just be called the Spirit. Or he may be called the Helper or the Comforter. Or you may just have the word He. And you know from the context who it's talking about. About 278 times he is referenced in the New Testament. Thus, he is somebody we need to give consideration to. Now, concerning the character of uh, the Holy Spirit and why we view him as holy, one reason we review him as holy is because he is God. And that's something that we've established with God the Father and, and actually in talking about Jesus when you study the life of Jesus. If Jesus is God, that by default makes him holy. So if we determine that the Holy Spirit is a person of the Godhead, he's holy. And it is just that simple. Now one thing to understand, and again I remind you that that we need to realize that he is a a, a person. Uh, a, A person just as God the Father and God the Son are persons, beings, if you will. Not just a not just an essence, uh, uh, but an actual being is the point. And you find over in John chapter 14 where Jesus 
is speaking to his disciples, and he's talking about leaving and how he's not going to leave them alone. And he makes the point there that uh, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he that is the Father will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So you have the emphasis there. He's described as a person, not an it, but he. So that there points to the fact that he was knowledged by our Lord himself, as well as others in the New Testament, as a person, as a person being, if you will. So that's one of the things to give consideration to him. Now in Romans chapter 2 and 8 and verse 27, we find one of many characteristics that are associated with personhood, qualities that demonstrate it's more than just a uh, it's, it's more than just a machine or, 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 or an essence, if you will. In Romans chapter 8 and in verse number 27, you find there in that particular text, it says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The point that is made there is he searches the hearts and he knows the mind of the Spirit. The Spirit has a mind. That indicates him being a being, a personal being. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and in verse number 11, 1 Corinthians 2 and in verse number 11, we read there, it says, What man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. The spirit of God knows. He knows God. He knows who God is. Because he is God, and I'll emphasize that a little bit more as we continue in this particular text here. As a matter of fact, let me just go ahead and say this about this particular passage here. What's interesting about this verse, this verse argues for the fact that he is God. When you consider there in the latter part of it, in the context, he says, What man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? So basically he's describing a human being and says, you know who you are and you know yourself better than virtually anybody else on this earth. Well, in that same comparison, he says there, even so no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. The implication based on the previous phrase there is the reason Holy Spirit knows who God is, is because he is God. In the same way that a man knows who he is, because he's a man, and he knows himself. So he's indicating the fact that he is God. He's, he's deity, which is why he understands what deity is, and why he can reveal it properly. Furthermore, we find in John chapter 15, John chapter 15, in verses 26 and 27, where Jesus there says, um, the helper, uh, but when the helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear, bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. He's going to testify about me. The Holy Spirit is able to teach. He's able to, to guide them into all truth, if you will. Furthermore, you have other things that are descriptive of him. For example, in Ephesians chapter 4 and in verse 30, Paul there said, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit. It's possible for the Holy Spirit to be grieved. Let me ask you, can a machine grieve? You know, can, a, uh, you know, can a, in essence, uh, you know, grieve? No. A person who possesses personhood can grieve. A, 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 some one who possesses personhood, he can be lied to. You can't lie to a thing. You can enter false information, but you can't lie to it. You can lie to a person, just as you can lie to the Holy Spirit, as you have in the example of Acts chapter 5, Ananias. And later on, his wife Sapphira, as they lie to Peter about property that they sold and how much they sold it for. And they were struck dead on the spot because they lied to the Holy Spirit, because they lied to God. So we can certainly see Holy Spirit is God and he possesses the qualities of God. 
Furthermore, he's even described as God, as we just talked about here a moment ago in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 and 11. That passage demonstrates he knows the mind of God in the same way that a man knows the mind of man. So he's, that describes him as God. And over in Acts chapter 5 that I just mentioned a moment ago, it's interesting, where as we read this, Peter says to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. The point is made there in verse 3. You lied to the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, you lied to God. By lying to the Holy Spirit, you're lying to God. So he's certainly described as God. And furthermore, it needs to be understood that he is described as a distinct person, a distinct being separate from God the Father and God the Son. And there's a number of passages that make that distinction. In Matthew chapter 28 and 19, Jesus says, Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The emphasis is all three persons. In Matthew 3, at the baptism of Jesus, verses 16 and 17, you find there that John baptizes Jesus, so there you have the one person, and then you read the heavens are open and the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, descends in the form of a dove, and a voice comes out of heaven. This is my beloved Son. Now, who would say that? The Father. So you have the Father, the Holy Spirit, and the Son all present at the baptism of Jesus. And as we noted even just a, a, a little bit earlier over there in John chapter 14, where Jesus made the promise that when he, le when he left, that he was not going to leave them alone. And he makes the observation there in verses 16 and 17. He says, uh, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper that you may abide, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth and the emphasis that Jesus is making here is I'm leaving. The Father is going to send you another helper, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth. Again, you have that, the, you have that emphasis of the three of them. Over in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and in verse number 14, you find there in that text, as Paul is concluding this letter, this is how he concludes it. He says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and amen. He talks about the three persons of the triune God. And there are multitudes of other passages that we could look at that make these distinctions. There's passages that show um, the, the Holy Spirit being distinct from God the Father and being distinct from Jesus. There's passages that show Jesus distinct from God and distinct from the Holy Spirit. And so uh, they're all three distinct individuals by numerous contexts. And that's why I, I, I cannot understand the argument of the oneness teachers, that there's only one person of, of God, uh, of the Godhead. I, I, uh, uh, there's too many passages of Scripture that describe it as three. And it takes mental and it takes, uh, it, 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 it takes word gymnastics to get around that. So we find that Holy Spirit is God, part of the triune God. Furthermore, he possesses the qualities of God. And let me just mention a couple of them here in Hebrews chapter 9 and in verse number 14. Hebrews 9 and in verse number 14, you find in that text, it tells us that how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. He offered himself through the eternal spirit. The spirit there is described as eternal. He would have been with the Lord when he offered himself. Psalm 139 and in verse number 7. Where can I flee from your spirit? And David goes on to describe, I can't hide, I can't, I can't climb the highest mountain, I can't hide in, hide in the darkest and deepest cave, I can't go to the bottom of the ocean, you're there. I can't hide from you, you're everywhere. And he says, where can I hide from your spirit? In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 
and in verse number 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 11, Paul talks about the power of the Spirit where miracles are concerned. And he makes the point, therefore, what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man who is in him? Oh, that, and that's dealing with his omniscience, if you will. The, the fact that he knows everything he needs to know. And then it's Romans 15 and in verse number 19 that talks about his power. Him being omnipotent, which means all-powerful. And you find in that particular verse there, Paul there says, In mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about the Icrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Paul's making the point there. Uh, the, the miracles that were done through the power of the Holy Spirit. The implication is there is he's, he, it comes from God. And so you find these are just some of the qualities and we could add many others to them. Now, when you establish that Holy Spirit is God, being God intrinsically... That makes him holy. We've already talked about how holiness is the, the prime quality of God. All the other qualities that we find associated with God are, are, are associated with his holiness, are, are manifested by his holiness. If Holy Spirit is, is, is God, then everything about him is holy as well. And that is why I believe he is described as the Holy Spirit, not just Spirit. If He's the Holy Spirit, we need to give consideration to that. But now that brings us to another question that we need to give consideration to. And that is to ask the question, uh, what does the Holy Spirit do? What is, and this is the way I describe this, what is the holy work of the Holy Spirit that causes us to view Him as holy where we are concerned. Turn over to Titus chapter 3. Over in Titus chapter 3, and beginning in verse number 4, we find there in that text, it says, When the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. And incidentally, did you notice you have God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Jesus in this text? Another example of that. But notice how he makes the observation there that God by his love, basically he appeared to us and he sent Jesus, but he says it wasn't by our works, we haven't earned it, but rather according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration. And I believe that that's a, a, a reference to baptism obeying the gospel and, and being made new, which uh, you look at some of these other verses here in a moment, you'll, you're going to see that. But then he also says the renewing of the Holy Spirit. The idea of being regenerated and, and renewed. The washing of generation. Baptism is that which makes us new. And friends, that's what Scripture teaches all over the place. You know, when you obey the gospel, when you become a Christian, you're a new person. A new creation. Acts chapter 22 and in verse 16. Uh, Ananias told Paul, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. The idea is you wash those sins. You make yourself clean. In Romans 6, 3 and 4. You were buried with him through baptism. We put to death the old man of sin. And raised to walk in newness of life. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17 tells us, If, in, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. He is a new creation in Christ, if you're in Christ. When you become a child of God, you are born again. That expression is associated with becoming a Christian. And the idea is you're supposed to put on a new man. You're supposed to be a different person. When you come out of that watery grave, it's supposed to be more than merely getting wet. It's supposed to be you You buried that old man of sin and you came out a new creature. You want to make sure you're right with God. That's why Jesus early on told Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Don't be surprised when I tell you to be born again. Over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 23, Peter there talks about having been born again 
not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed through the word of God which lives and abides forever. We're born again when we become children of God. And here's the point I want you to see in this. The Titus chapter 3 and verse 5, the washing of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a part in our salvation. He makes us renewed. He has a part in our being regenerated when we obey the gospel and becoming new. We may not understand everything about that part, but just understand he's a part of our salvation. So that's what you have with uh, a, a work that he does. And along with that, he sanctifies us. And one of the things we've talked about as we've dealt with the subject of holiness throughout this study is the word sanctify is actually a derivative in the Greek language from the same word that we get, the word holy. And the idea of being sanctified is to be set apart. And isn't that what being holy is? You are set apart from that which is common in that the rest of the world. The Holy Spirit sanctifies us. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and in verse number 13, we read there in that text, it says, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved of by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit, and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel. So you find in that text there that we're sanctified of the Spirit. He sanctifies us. You know, in Acts chapter 2 and in verse 38, uh, Peter there on the day of Pentecost told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. That's obeying the gospel to have your sins washed away. But he added to that, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I know that there is debate. Is this gift talking about the Holy Spirit being given to you, or is it something that the Holy Spirit gives to you? And in my understanding, at least right now, my understanding of this is it's talking about the Holy Spirit's gift to us. And that gift would be what we're talking about here, sanctification, salvation. He's provided a way for us to be saved. He has a part in that. And that's something that's available to everybody as we move on when you obey the gospel. Because the promise is to all who call on him. You find over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 2. 1 Peter chapter 1 and in verse number 2. As Peter begins that letter, he talks about the elect according to the foreknowledge of God in sanctification of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit has set us apart. He's done what is necessary to set us apart for God. And we can look at many other verses. There's, there is one that I want you to think about here, and, and this is over in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 21. And, and you find here in this verse that Paul is talking about vessels of honor and vessels of, of dishonor in a house, and how there's vessels that have one purpose and vessels that have another purpose. Some are honorable and some aren't. And he says, you need to be honorable. You need to strive to be a vessel of honor. But he makes the point there in verse 21, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Now, what I want you to note in that verse is he says, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter. And I just want you to keep this in mind. Even though we're talking about the Holy Spirit sanctifying us and setting us apart, doing his part to make that happen, it doesn't mean that we don't do anything. We have to uh, cleanse ourselves so that we can be sanctified. We've got a part in this. Something that you find all throughout Scripture. You also have uh, just another side on this, Ephesians 1.13, uh, describing the blessings as Paul comes down to the bottom of that list. He talks about how uh, the, the Spirit, uh, 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 we're sealed in the, with the Spirit. And, and uh, uh, you find that in chapter 4, verse 30. I, do, I simply believe that the point that is being made there is what I've been talking about here. God has given us the Holy Spirit, and he's done his part in saving us. In 
uh, in saving us and, be, and being a part of the process of salvation. And in that, in that way, he sealed us for God. So he sanctifies us. Something else we find that Holy Spirit does is he intercedes on our behalf. Over in Romans chapter 8, and if you want to understand a little bit about the Spirit working in us, this is where you go is Romans chapter 8. Just be careful. But in Romans 8 and verse 26, it says there, The Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we, ought, what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with, with groanings which cannot be uttered. He intercedes on our behalf. He ensures that our prayers are properly presented before God. Understand that Holy Spirit, being God, like Jesus and like God the Father, he knows, what, he knows what's in our mind. He knows everything. And if you're struggling to say the right words, have you ever, you ever been that way? Maybe even in approaching God in prayer, you're just at a loss of what to say. And, and you might just simply say, help me, or something like that. And with a contrite and genuine heart, you're pleading to God for help. Holy Spirit, he knows what you mean. Just as Jesus intercedes for us, he intercedes for us as we pray to God. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a holy work of the Holy Spirit. And furthermore, we do need to understand when we talk about the Holy Spirit, we need to understand that He does dwell within us. And friends, this is not something, if we study the Word of God, that we can argue about. We cannot dispute His dwelling. In Romans chapter 8, beginning in verse 9, Paul there said, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Through his spirit who dwells in you. Like three times in those verses, it talks about him dwelling in you. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Go to a different, uh, a, a different book. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Whom you have from God and you are not your own. For you were brought at a price bought at a price therefore glorify in your glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's he says there that the the body of the temple of the holy spirit is in you so he's dwelling in us in second timothy chapter 1 and in verse number 14 we read there in that text that good thing which was committed to you Keep by the Holy Spirit who dwells in you. There's just a couple of passages. Others could be added. But the point is, is over and over, it's emphasized that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And we cannot deny that. But I tell you right now, how he dwells in us, that's another question. And that's a little more challenging. It requires a little bit of work to understand. And when I talk about this, I, I think of it, it, there's two conceivable ways that he can dwell within us. Either he directly dwells within us, and what that means is that he personally comes into our lives and he regulates either part or all of our lives. And there are some who actually teach that the Holy Spirit takes over your life. Or you have the idea of an indirect dwelling. His influence is there, and there's a sense in which people and things can dwell within us indirectly. It's, it's, it's not that thing, you, you know, you talk about, you know, like talk about taking a drill bit and drilling a hole in your head and pouring knowledge in it. And so the knowledge is inside it, you know, you know that you're not literally pouring knowledge. You're not really literally going to drill somebody's head. But the idea is if you learn something, that knowledge dwells in you. We'll see more of that as we go through. So you have these two ways, and the question is, which one is right? How does he dwell within us? 
And I will admit that this is a subject that even to this day, I do not fully understand everything about him and his influence. But I will tell you this. There are things that I know it is not. There are ways that I know that he cannot be dwelling in us. And one of those, he cannot be directly and personally indwelling in each of us who are Christians from the standpoint of where he comes in there and, 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 and he whispers to us. And he uh, physically tells us which decision to make or things like that. Friends, I want you to understand this. If the Holy Spirit directs, directly dwells within you, then that is a miracle. Based on the definition of what a miracle is, you know, that which is out of the ordinary, you know, that, that which is unnatural, that is done. That's associated with that which is miraculous. And if the Holy Spirit directly dwells within you, then it's a miraculous indwelling. But I tell you what, friends, we find in Scripture that the age of miracles are complete. They have been done away with, as you read about over in 1 Corinthians 13, 8 through 13. Uh, spiritual gifts were going to be done away with. When? When that which is perfect has come. And I'm convinced from that text and others that that's a reference to the Word of God. And we're going to see why that applies here in just a moment, but I want you to know, like, for example, over in Jude in verse number 3, uh, Jude there, he wanted to write to them about our common salvation, but he found it necessary to write to you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. He's talking about the teachings of God. It's been delivered. You find over in 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 3, talking about grace and peace being multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ uh, our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. We have all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. This book tells us everything we need to know and that's the point. And friends, if we have the completed word of God, we don't need miracles anymore. Furthermore, Based on what scriptures teach, it's not possible for us to have miracles. Uh, you understand that it was through the laying on of the apostles' hands that the ability to perform miracles and various other um, uh, direct spiritual gifts were offered. You read about that in Acts 8, 18, where Simon sees it through the laying on of the apostles' hands, and he offered him money for the ability to do that. And Peter says, no, your money perished with you. It's not about that. Here's the point. All the apostles are dead. Everyone who was alive during their generation is dead. Everyone upon whom they laid their hands is gone. They've, they're, they're either in the presence of God or if they walked away from God, they're in, they're in eternal torments. But because that generation is completely gone, we don't have miracles anymore. And friends, I contend that we don't need them because we have the completed word of God. So when we talk about that, we give consideration to the, the fact that um, the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, it cannot be a direct personal indwelling because of that. Furthermore, if he influences us directly in spiritual matters, let me ask you this, how can you be sure that it's him? And here's the point. If you have a subjective leading, how can you know it's him that's directing you? What happens when you say, the Spirit told me to do this, and this turns out to be the wrong thing? You make the wrong choice. Think about that. You know, over in Romans chapter 7, and in verse number 17, Paul there makes a point about sin. And he says there in that verse, But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. You know that sin can dwell in you? Let me ask you, is, is sin a person? Uh, is, is it like, you know, you know, taking that drill bit and pouring sin in, uh, you know, sin, sin in your brain and, and therefore sin's dwelling in you? Or is it the idea of the influence of sin is working in your life? 
What about 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11? Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. You think Satan, Satan, if, if, if he could dwell in you, that, uh, that he would lie to you and he would, he would encourage you to do the wrong thing? And my point is, 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 is if the decisions we make are subjective and if the Spirit's leading is, is a subjective leading, he leads me one way and you another way, then how do we know if it's him or if it's the devil? it's him or if it's you lying to yourself because of sin you don't want to give up tell you what, there's a lot of people that profess the leading of the Holy Spirit and uh, they uh, say that he gives them permission to live in their sinful lifestyles friends I have a problem with that and friends, that's why we need to understand that, that his, his influence cannot be a direct, personal indwelling. I'm convinced that the way he dwells within us is indirectly. And what that means is he influences by what he does. And as we react to what he does, what he has put in place, when we respond with what he has put in place, he is dwelling within us. He is influencing us. And this primarily takes place through the Word of God, which is the product of Him that we're going to see here in a minute. But before we get to that, I just want to make this point. This is consistent with the idea of dwelling. Over in 1 John 4 and in verse 15, we find that God is to dwell within us. And you read there in that text, and I want to go ahead and go over here because we're going to come back to this one. You find here that John tells us where he says, whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And I want you to mark that. In Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse number 17. Ephesians chapter 3 and in verse number 17. We read there that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. In 1 John chapter 3 and in verse 17, it talks about the love of God dwelling in you. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 7, and this is an interesting one where Paul says to these brethren here, he says, just as, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart. Is that physically? Has he physically taken them or even taken a, a physical part of their body and, and plugged it into his heart? Or is he talking about what they mean to him? I have you in my heart. You're there because of who you are. It's not the personal you that's there. It's the influence that you have upon me. Friends, I, I believe that that's the way that the Spirit works in us today. At least primarily that's the way He works. You know, His Word is to dwell within us. Over in 2 John and in verse number 2, you read there that the truth dwells within us where John is commending the elect lady there and he says because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever the truth abides in us it dwells in us Colossians 3 and verse 16 says let the word of Christ dwell in us richly or again in 1 John in 1 John 2 and in verse number 14 you read there in that text where it talks about uh, I have written to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. So there we have the word of God dwelling in us. Now, how is the word of God dwelling in us? It's influencing us. It's influencing us. We, we listen to what it says, and we react based upon what we are told to do and not to do, based upon the Word of God. I want you to tie that to the work of the Holy Spirit. You realize that the way He influences us is primarily through His Word. I want you to consider a couple of other passages here. In John chapter 8 and in verse number 31. And this deals with the Word. And you find here in this text... John 8 and verse 31, where Jesus there says, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth. 
and the truth will make you free. When Jesus talks about him abiding uh, in, uh, in, in them and them abiding in him, if you abide in my word, now let me ask you, when you're dealing with abiding there, Jesus has said something. Are you literally going to dwell in that? Or are you going to physically possess that? Or is it going to influence you? John 15 and in verse 7. And, and I want you to notice this. John 15 and in verse number 7 where it says there, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. And he goes on. Notice he says, you abide in me and my word abides in you. You have a reciprocal abiding. We are to abide in him. Jesus says we are to dwell in him. How is that? Same way that his word dwells or abides within us. Same thing with John 4 or 1 John 4, 15 that we read a few moments ago. It says, God abides in him and he in God. It's reciprocal. The idea is God has made a home with us. The idea is he's accepted us. We are a part of his family. So we abide in him because he abides in us, which means he influences us. And all of that is what we need to give consideration to when we think about how the Holy Spirit works. Now, his primary work, it has to do with the Word of God. And this is the point I want us to understand about all of this. It is through the Word, uh, or, the whole, or the Bible, what we need to understand, the Bible is the work of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14 and in verse 16, we read there, he says, uh, I will pray the Father, he will give you a helper, and that the Spirit of truth, uh, whom the world cannot receive, and neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. So the Spirit of truth is the way he's described. And then in verse 26 of chapter 14, he says, The helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Chapter 16 uh, verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. He's going to direct you into what to say and what to write and what to teach. So what you teach is going to be what he tells you. When it comes to God's word, it's always been that way. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and in verse 19, you read there, We have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The point that is being made there is holy men of God, they said what the Holy Spirit told them to say. And I could give you multitudes of examples. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul talks about how God made known to him the mystery. That mystery was that salvation is now available to everybody, not just the Jews. And he goes on and he says in verse uh, uh, verse number three, uh, made known the mystery as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So you find there that the Holy Spirit reveals God. And the Holy Spirit has, this word is a product of the Holy Spirit. And therefore we can say, and it is accurate to say this, if we do what this says, and let this influence the decisions that we make, then the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us. He's dwelling in us through the word. He's influencing us through his word. We need to understand that. He reveals God and his will through the writings of inspired men. That's why Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, if anyone is a prophet, let him acknowledge that the things I say are the word of God. Paul in Ephesians 6, in describing the armor of God in verse 17, described the sword of the spirit as the word of God. So friends, in whatever way the Holy Spirit works and dwells within us, 
It's related to his word. What we're taught is what influences us. That's why I reject new revelations. When somebody comes and says, God spoke to me. And when some religious leader that's been caught in immorality says, God spoke to me and told me to tell you to mind your own business, something that happened a number of years ago. Friends, that's not the Holy Spirit speaking. Holy Spirit influences us through his word. Friends, that's why we need his word. Now, how should I respond to the Holy Spirit? And I realize that I'm out of time, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to briefly mention these things. And in coming weeks, these things are going to be developed in much greater detail, uh, as well as other things, as we talk about developing holiness in our lives. Number one, when I understand that He is the Holy Spirit and that He is holy, I need to view Him as God. As I live my life, I should not be doing things that grieve Him. I should not be doing things that quench Him, that is, put Him out, that uh, not doing what He tells me to do. I should not do things that insult Him. And, and I need to think about all these things. Uh, 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 Matthew 12, 31 and 32 talks about blaspheming the Holy Spirit as an unpardonable sin. And I know that's a whole other story, but, I, uh, but just let me tell you, I need to take seriously how I talk about the Spirit. I need to be as reverent toward the Spirit as I am toward God and toward the Son. I need to walk in the Spirit. I need to let His Spirit guide me in my life. As you read in Galatians 5 and in verse 16, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. That right there describes how we walk in the Spirit and how He dwells within us. We make the decision that we're going to do what He says to do and we're not going to walk in the ways of the world. That's what we need to do. We need to walk according to the Spirit. Romans 8, 4, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Where we've already talked about that. The Spirit of God dwells in you. We need to be filled with the Spirit. And what's interesting about that in, in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 18, Paul says, Do not be drunk with wine in it, which is dissipation, but be filled with with the Spirit. You realize that that's an imperative, which means it's a command. That's a command that is being given. We are to, we are to fill ourselves with the Spirit. That's something that we do. It's not something that we allow to happen to us. And if He directs, directly dwells within us, it's, it's allowing Him to do something to us. We have to do our part to be filled with the Spirit. We do that by obeying the Word of God. Furthermore, I should strive to produce fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is described in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. And the types of qualities you find there, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against which there is no law. Those are the types of qualities that we need to develop. And if the Spirit is in us and influencing us, all of these qualities are going to be present. I need to strive for unity, Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. He wants brethren to be united. Come together with His Word, not let His Word drive us apart. And finally, I need to let Him make me holy. If He's Holy Spirit, if He's the Holy Spirit, I need to realize that He's the Holy Spirit and I need to let Him make me holy. And how do I do that? I listen to what He says, as I've said over and over. I listen to the message that He's given us and I let that influence my life. And friends, I'm going to tell you right now, that's how you're led by the Spirit. And I want you to understand this. If you're led by the Spirit, you're also being led by God. You're also being led by Christ. Christ is dwelling in you. God is dwelling in you. The Spirit is dwelling in you. His Word is dwelling in you. Perhaps others. So friends, I want to encourage you to think about all these things as we give consideration to what it means to be holy. Is the Holy Spirit leading you closer to God? Another way of saying that is, are you doing what he tells you to do?
Think about that, and the lesson is yours. And if you would, please bow with me at this time. Our dear God and our Heavenly Father, as always, we are so thankful that you've blessed us in so many ways. We are thankful that you loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us, to provide the sacrifice necessary for our sins. And we are thankful for the helper, the Holy Spirit, who guides us through this life, through his word. Help us, dear God, to cherish the word that he has given us and help us to live with a resolve that we're going to let him influence us in everything that we say, in everything that we do, everywhere that we go, and even in our thoughts. Dear God, help us to be examples to others. We ask all of this in your son's name, and amen. And once again, thank you, and once again, welcome back. Uh, it is good to be back with you and, and uh, to continue our studies together. Hopefully there's something beneficial in the things that we have said here, something you can apply to your life now and into the week and whatever time God gives you with for the rest of your life. Be faithful to him. Strive to live a holy life. Thank you and have a good day.